All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Tuesday, October 15th, 2019 uh, Board of Selectmen's meeting. Apologize, we're starting a little bit late. Uh, executive session went a little bit longer than we uh, anticipated. Um, I'll read the agenda, um, even though the timing isn't right anymore. Uh, seven, citizens input. 705, wayfinding and branding. 720, rotary, uh, temporary traffic control plan. Uh, 740, Gillette Stadium annual event license. 8 o'clock, selectman's update. 805, town manager's update. 810, assistant town manager's update. And then we have a few action items. Uh, Leah, would you lead us? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, citizens' input. <laughs> Keeping us on our toes. I was going to say, you should sit right up, up front. <laughs> Pat Stevens, 63 Mechanic Street. I want to give a heads up for Chris. Um, I don't know if you've been uh, at Mechanic Chris? Street. Yes, um, our engineer. There's a speed limit 30 sign that's now blinking. Yeah. And I have noticed people are slowing down a little bit. So, and... I don't know what morning it was, but I was on my way to work at 6 o'clock, and he was on Mechanic Street spray painting with an orange can, those, whatever those things are we had to avoid one morning in the dark. So those are things he does that we don't see sometimes. Nice job, Chris. So thank you. Thanks, Pat. For both. Thank you. Um, wayfinding and branding. Hello, Hi. Paige Duncan, Planning Director, if you don't know. Um, so as you all are aware, but for anybody watching on TV who hasn't um, heard, Foxborough uh, received a grant last year to obtain consultant services to help us establish a bit of a brand for our downtown. Um, we've talked quite a bit about it, um, but just want to run you through the project a little bit and we're ready, we've submitted some documentation and we're ready to get into the nitty gritty of this. Um, so the goal when we started out was basically to uh, ensure continued vibrancy of the downtown. We've mentioned that the master plan identified the downtown area as the number one area needing improvement and also one of the most special places in downtown. So it was showing how much people in the town really care about this area. Um, we also want to support our businesses and create a sense of vitality, a sense of place, and a destination. So these wayfinding and branding projects, um, as supported by the state of Massachusetts through their downtown initiative program, are a way to help communities sort of establish a, this sense of place. So um, what our first step to do was to sort of create a working group and um, here's a list of the folks that participated in the working group. As you could see, we had a, a, a varied representation. Um, we had numerous meetings and um, fairly well attended, especially to start. We did taper off as we got into the more um, nuts and bolts, but um, we did were able to come up with a, a, a visual that um, the committee was pleased with. Um, so we, through the process, the consultant led us through sort of um, the historical context and what he calls an ideation exercise. So we were able to go through and identify important symbols and, and, and characteristics of the community. Um, one of the items that was identified as, as unique and special was the, the fence around the common. So when we get to the images, I could show you, but the, the signage would be um, sort of framed by a replication of the, of the fence at the top, at the bottom there. So it's kind of nice little nod to the common fence. Um, and then the graphic uh, ends up being a portion of Memorial Hall with the statue above, the, the sentinel above it. Um, they're historical and yet timeless. We we're trying to stay away from trendy or anything sort of very commercial. Um, during the color and um, sort of ideation exercise, there were many colors presented and the blue and gold slash yellow really stood out as identifying for Foxborough. Um, and then one of the big things that for our, this project that sort of, I don't want to say derailed us, but it, it distracted us a bit was all the existing signs out there. We've talked about this before, where we have too many signs out there. So one of the things we identified as our working group was that we needed to get rid of some sign clutter. 
I know the visuals aren't great on this um, graphic. I do have a handout, but this is sort of the, the family of elements that were designed. You can't see it as closely, but here this is sort of the replication of the, uh, the common fence. We did choose to have the black around there. I think the consultant went through a lot of this, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. So getting into specifics, you asked us for specifics previously. Um, we're proposing to remove 41 hour parking signs um, located on School, South, Liberty, Central, Cocasset, Bird, and Mechanic Streets. We do have a sign over in the back of the room that shows every sound in downtown and indicates by color code whether it would stay or go or be questionable. They're very hard to look at. More, they're available if anybody wants to, but um, we've distilled it down to this summary. Um, we're proposing to remove one 15-minute parking sign in front of 11 Bird Street. We're not, that was a throwback. Um, the hair salon was the last one there, and I know they had asked for it to be removed, or they want it removed. They didn't request it. No? Okay. Well, they did sort of through us. Um, and, um, but they're gone now. But anyway, we, we're suggesting to remove that 15-minute sign. Um, we're proposing, since you've just been through the Primo Pizza exercise, we're not proposing to touch those signs. And then um, putting the ball in your court with respect to the Bird Street signs, there are worse, there might, there's a possible change of use down at that end, and we'll let you decide on that one. Right now, we're not recommending one way or another, but you know, we, I did count, I think, um, three or four 15-minute signs on Bird Street out of 11. So it's, it's a little questionable over there whether the, that they need that many, but I'm going to leave that one to you. Um, there's a, all the white 40, 140 signs, those would be proposed to remove. There's a large, the large green uh, directional signs, those would remain. Um, Chris thinks he might be able to take the I-95 blue one that looks quite official and strap that over to one of the poles with the green on there to sort of get rid of another sign um, pole. And um, it's amazing how much bigger that sign is when you get up next to it. You know, it looks like a little sign, but when you're up there, it's pretty big. Um, that would actually leave the second island over in front of Bay Colony clear of all signage. And um, then there'd be only one sign on the first island. And then the other ones on the third island, you really, you know, we need some traffic control. You need, like, do not enter and stops. Um, although the question has come up whether you do need stops there. And that was discussion last week. Um, and then remove all the um, old parking signs. There's just a few parking signs over on Wall Street and Cocasset Street that go to our parking areas because we are proposing to replace those with our wayfinding signs. And then there's one sign that um, references Town Hall Municipal Lot at Liberty and Central. And again, we'd be replacing that. So these are the signs to be removed. You do have a report that lists all that. Um, and then we'd be looking to do new parking signs. Um, we actually walked the site. We had Ryan and Chris, Gabby, myself. We all walked um, through the whole downtown and looked at actual locations. So we do have a rather sophisticated map over here of our, uh, of our proposed locations. So we're proposing a single-sided um, parking sign, uh, Wall Street, right in front of 8 Wall Street. That would replace the old one. Cocasset Street would be a double-sided. That would be installing a new base on the sidewalk in front of the Verizon building. At South and Liberty Place, we'd be double-sided. Um, we'd have to kind of figure out the best location of that because we don't want to clutter up the corner over here by the monuments and whatnot. Um, Mechanic Street, double-sided. We'd be using an existing base for the one-hour parking in front of 15 Mechanic. Um, then we'd need a single-sided on Mechanic. This is a little bit of a tricky area because um, the railroad tracks. So we actually, that would be done, sort of located on side, like out on the field. But it's basically between uh, sort of Cumberland Farms and the railroad tracks somewhere there. So the folks coming into town would see it best. And then over at Railroad Ave, um, we do have that new parking lot. So we were thinking at this sort of kitty corner that Railroad and Bird sort of nestled over there. We could have it so that folks coming from either Bird Street or Railroad would be able to see it with one sign. So those were just but your parking. The arrows would obviously be depending on what direction they were to go in, but those are your sort of basic um, wayfinding parking. Then we have these modified directional signs, and um, these are basically where they'd be identifiable as um, Foxborough with the, the, the motif, but then we'd have them uh, directing you to certain <coughs> amenities like parking. Um, you, we'd have one at Central and Wall Street, double-sided, come to the town hall, the post office, and parking. We would have one over at South Street and School Street, Street which would be single-sided, directing to town hall, recreation, schools, and parking. Parking hours would be in both directions. We would be able to use an existing base for that one. Um, and then Cocasset Street and Bird Street, a single-sided, directing to parking and library. 
Obviously, these details of the wording and such could be a changed if we want to dig in a little deeper on that. If someone else, as they're seeing this, has a suggestion for another location uh, that we might have omitted, uh, we're glad to talk about that. But these were the general main amenities we felt that needed to be mentioned. Um, and then, sort of as a welcome gateway type thing, we're looking at something like Welcome to Foxborough Common, and these would be sort of like a block outside of town. And so we're looking um, at Main Street in the vicinity of Granite Street, uh, Mechanic Street in the vicinity of Railroad, Cocasset Street, um, right near 21 Cocasset, and then Central Street in the vicinity of Gray Road. Um, we also do want to do that one down at South Street in Liberty Place, um, but we couldn't really come up with a good location and we don't want to force it yet. So we don't know what's going to happen over on, uh, if Mr. Lynch is going to do anything over there, perhaps we'd look at it then, but for right now we didn't want to like jam a sign in just for the sake of jamming a sign in. So for right now we're holding off on that one unless someone has a strong feeling. We walked it and it was just kind of difficult to, you know, there's residential properties along there and we just don't necessarily want to put it in just because. So we're looking for the best location and we just, we held off on that recommendation right now. Um, so how are we going to pay for this? That was something you guys asked is the estimate for the current proposal for materials is about, is under $5,000. It is subject to bidding. Um, Mr. Faberman did say that with the tariffs that went in place, some prices have gone up. I did check with a few towns and the pricing seemed on point. Um, so go from there. We um, do have received $3,000 in um, funds in the gift account. I believe you accepted it the last weekend. Um, I know Mr. Keegan has a promise of another $5,000 coming from someone else and I've heard of um, some possible other donations. If we didn't have that and if there was a gap, I would propose that we have some um, funds in the Economic Development Fund, which that those funds are collected when you um, do a liquor license and it goes in an account controlled by you. And I would suggest that perhaps um, any remaining, you know, if we did fall short, which I'm not sure we would, but if we did, I would suggest that perhaps this would be very clear use of Economic Development Funds for the downtown. So, and that's really what I have. Looks great. <laughs> uh, Questions, phaseless. comments, that's concerns. How about the phases too? How this is just phase one? This is just phase one for right now. I think we're just, we, you know, really the decluttering took up so much effort. You know, Ryan really did a tremendous job and uh, Tom Murphy and his son, between all of them, I mean, there's just hundreds of signs out there. So we spent so much time on that and then we knew we were aware of funding. We didn't want to do co go too crazy. And also we just really wanted to start to get a feel for it, create this sense of destination. I think as it becomes successful, it'll become clear. We also are working with the downtown group on uh, banners. You know, so we're trying to really start to create this in phases. Um, I do think that we'll be back with more proposals, but for right now we felt this was a fair and good start to sort of not go too crazy as we evolve. Go ahead, Dave. No, I was just going to say on the, um, on the parking signage, be very careful with white on yellow. Okay. Very difficult to see, particularly in daytime. Okay. Um, you might want to contrast the yellow, maybe go back with the blue on the P. On the P, you know, that's a good point. Uh, other than that, I, I think it's uh, very well thought out. Thank you. Um, my only thought, when, with one of the directional signs, you had schools, would you want to be more specific, like high school or school administration? Uh, well, that's the thing. It gets, I mean, you are limited, obviously, in the amount of text you can fit on there. And the more you do, the smaller it has to be, and you want to be able to read it. And I, we just kind of felt that schools were somewhat general enough because there's a few schools there's down, three that, down way. that way. Yeah. So, um, but again, that's some, we're certainly looking for input on that. You know, if there's a better way of doing it. But you know, if you start to break it down, I don't know that we could call out every school. Right. So, we'll have to trade that off. Okay. So, Jim, just to just to edify um, one of the comments that Paige had made. So. Um, Certainly, you know, fundraising now is important to try and get this program running where it should be. So the $5,000 that, that Paige alluded to was actually a, um, the developer who, was, who just recently did um, Mansfield. Uh, Forbes Crossing. Forbes Crossing, rather, was, uh, had agreed to, to build a Welcome to Foxborough sign as part of his, his project. And that uh, what happened was that the, he ran into problems with getting DOT to approve the area where they could put it. So I approached him and I said, look, instead of doing that, would you be, we just came up with this new program for a new signage in the downtown, would you be willing to contribute that same amount of money you're gonna to contribute to that towards this? So he agreed to do that. So 
Uh, so that's just another, a redirection of some existing funding that was already earmarked for, some, for another area. But certainly anybody who wants to, I know that some people have contributed to it towards the effort already, and I think it's um, certainly we're welcome, to, we're, we welcome the opportunity to, to take more if, if people only do that. And just to point out, these uh, these are my particular favorites. We didn't get them in phase one, mm -hmm. but I mean that might be something eventually we want to work with where you could yeah, have you know, actual names of schools or something. Okay. It's yep. a kind of a nice little feature. But we didn't. Again, we were very cognizant of not being clutter. We have so much clutter out there. We wanted to make sure this wouldn't add to clutter out there. So for right now, that's why we aren't. It wouldn't oh. go with that one. Okay. Yeah. And Great speaking idea. of adding to clutter, so we just have to all work together about new signs. So. If someone asks for a sign that we don't just put it up, that they have to actually go through a process to request a sign, like maybe a form, to come before the Board of Selectmen, would look at it. So just being more strategic as we peel things away, what new signs go up? And we'll obviously have to keep an eye to that with the traffic patterns. Mm -hmm. So I think that those two are going to tie in together. But um, we just need to all make sure that we don't re-clutter. <laughs> Agreed. Together. Agreed. Are you all done with the consultant that helped with this, or is that still ongoing? No, we are done. He is, I believe, waiting to see what you guys do to put in his final report. So there will be a report that comes out of it, um, but basically he's done with us. Do we use up the entire grant? Well, you get services, so yes. You ba we don't get the money. We get $15,000 worth of consultant services, so I would contend he says yes. And, you know, he has, he's been very good, you know, as I've asked for different changes and whatnot, he's been very available to us. So, in fact, I didn't ask him to come out tonight. I kind of <coughs> decided to do this one on my own. So he might have. I just yeah. figured we'd be better off on our own. So the other phases, um, do you guys have all of that from him, from the work We will. Done? I mean... So once he finalizes it, then yes, he gives us the specs so that when we, then we go out to bid with that. But yes, we should be able to formulate a new bid package for phase two um, using what he has. Okay. Good. What do you need from us now? Um, uh, are we voting to approve phase one? Um, well, I'm hoping you would vote to approve. You might want to see if there's any public comment, because I know we do have somebody from the Historical Commission here that might want to have, I don't know. If, <laughs> He has any comments? No? I, well, I wanted to make sure you were represented. Um. He, he served on the committee, so he was... Yeah, he did serve on it. But I also want to make sure everybody has a chance to be heard. And um, so, uh, yeah. But so we are hoping for a vote. And if you were willing to give us a sort of fallback funding, um, perhaps, you know, we've, we're at a gap of $2,000, maybe not to exceed that or something to that effect. And then obviously we wouldn't use it if we get additional donations. But if Bill's pretty sure that we're going to get the 5000 you're going to be over. But does that, um, is that for over there only? No, it's for, it's, it's for, for any of it's it? For, for any oh. of the sign. It's just general use. So. Never mind. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't specifically for that area. Okay, yeah, great. So that, that's great. I but had an earmark sort of as a gateway sign into town, so I didn't want to count on it for um, everybody. But. So I guess I don't need funding. I'm wondering if the Board of Selectmen wants to support this and let us figure out how to get it done. So... Or uh, maybe um, move to approve phase one of um, the uh, wayfinding, wayfinding and uh, branding proposal. What do you think? Does that cover it? Mm -hmm. uh, I make a motion to accept the wayfinding project, uh, the initial aspects for the downtown phase, center. Phase one. Phase one. Second. All right. Any further comment? All those in favor? Aye. Good work, everybody. Yeah, that was great work, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It was a really great group. <coughs> awesome. Thank you, Paige. I think, we, I think we missed a few World Series games during this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was that. Like, <laughs> yeah. World Series were more relevant. Yeah, that's right. Not, not as relevant this year. Another fun project. The Rotary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Temporary Traffic Control Plan. <laughs> Anybody up there? Yeah, I was going to say. Well, yeah. Tim's I'll, I'll let Tim take the podium. <laughs> <laughs> um, just Welcome back. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Gallagher. I'm the town engineer for anybody watching at home. Um, we're back here tonight to continue the discussion on the traffic patterns around the common um, and look for uh, an approval on a trial um, to move forward. 
Um, I have with me Tim, Tim Thompson with Parcorp, who's the consulting engineer who's been working on, on this project going back to last spring and really a little bit before that as well. Um, so just a little quick recap, last spring we came before the board with, with the design and plan that PAR had done. Um, to address some of the concerns that, that were had voiced around the common. Um, it was um, the strong desire of the board to have a public meeting to get input from residents and, and business owners around the common and throughout town. Um, we did that last Tuesday. Um, it was a good meeting, it was a good discussion. We heard some concerns, we heard some support. Um, we had police chief there, um, Bill Keegan was there, um, Tim was there doing some presentations, um, as well as Paige and planning board staff and a ver various members of, of the community. Um, so we're here before you tonight. We're gonna go through some of the features of that design and then really focus on the, the one piece that we're looking to move forward at this point in time, which is up on the Main Street um, intersection. So with that, I'm going to let Tim um, go through there some slides. <laughs> That's conserving people, switching, switching uh, gears. <laughs> old fashioned still works sometimes. There you go. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, again, my name is Tim Thompson. I'm a traffic engineer with PAR Corporation. Um, as Chris mentioned, we, we've been uh, looking at the common for several months now, um, looking to uh, analyze ways that we can improve traffic circulation through the common. Um, and really develop something that can be implemented for, for a trial period. Uh, so tonight I'm just going to go through what we've done to date, um, recap of what we've studied thus far, um, and ultimately uh, provide the recommendation that, that we've given to the town uh, for implementing this, this trial. Uh, so just to touch on existing conditions of, of the common, as I'm sure you all are, are very familiar with it, but um, Foxborough Town Commons formed by the convergence of seven roadways. It forms a rotary style uh, type of intersection layout, consists of two circulating travel lanes going through the, uh, the rotary. Um, there's the landscape park center uh, of the rotary, which is where the, the common itself. Uh, there's both angled parking, there's parallel parking um, that surround the common. Um, there's multiple crosswalks, there's sidewalks that are throughout the common. Um, so it's really an area, it's really a unique space. Um, it serves a multiple, it serves multiple uh, types of users, vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists. Um, so it, there's, there's a lot of different conflict points, there's a lot of different users, there's a lot of traffic volume that, that utilizes this, uh, this network. Uh, so I'm just going to, um, the aerial behind me here, uh, just to orient you with, with where we are looking at the common, this is Main Street. Uh, that comes into the common from the north, uh, Central Street to the south, uh, Mechanic and Cacasset uh, up at this leg of the intersection. So this orientation will kind of continue on throughout the rest of this, this presentation, just so you're familiar with it. Uh, we, we've done quite a bit of traffic observation uh, throughout the common. I'm just gonna point out some of the more notable traffic behavior characteristics that we've seen. Um, there is a significant period of, of traffic congestion during the PM peak hour. Uh, most notably, the, the southbound entrance to the common from Main Street experiences recurrent congestion, uh, reaches over 2,000 feet. Uh, we've actually, we've gone out, we've timed how long it takes a uh, vehicle to get from the back of that queue till you enter into the common. It's been about four or five minutes during, during typical weekday peak periods. Uh, Mechanic Street also experiences some recurrent congestion. Much, uh, much less than uh, that which is observed on, on Main Street, but uh, Mechanic Street, we can typically see a queue of about 550 feet or two, uh, 20 to 25 vehicles during that PM peak hour. Uh, there's less congestion on Central Street, but still some uh, recurrent congestion, uh, more in the range of the 250 feet, 10 to 15 vehicle typical peak during that, uh, that PM uh, afternoon rush hour period. Um, Another observation is, is that drivers really tend to use the outer lane of the common. So as I mentioned, the, the common has two circulating travel lanes. Um, and really, the fact that there's no way to directly enter or exit the common from that center lane uh, really contributes to the fact that, that drivers feel a lot more comfortable um, circulating the common through that outer lane. That gets into to limiting gaps for uh, vehicles that approach the common to actually be able to enter the common. So that, um, that's fairly critical when we talk about some of the ways that we're trying to improve uh, traffic circulation throughout the common. 
Uh, drivers also tend to, uh, there's also a lack of turn signal uh, usage that we've noticed out there. Uh, when a driver is, is exiting uh, the, the roundabout or rotary, I should say, um, that frequently they, they aren't using their traffic, their, uh, their turn signal. Um, a driver that's looking to enter into the, uh, the rotary can, can miss a gap um, if that happens to occur. Driver behavior can also be aggressive. Um, drivers are willing to uh, accept narrower gaps in traffic. Uh, vehicle speeds can also be high. Uh, we've gone through a data collection effort uh, throughout the common. We did traffic counts back in May when school was in session. Uh, we collected data during the typical weekday PM peak hour uh, from 7 to 9 in the morning and then the typical PM peak from, from 4 to 6 in the afternoon. Uh, we did a 48-hour continuous count on uh, Market Street, Baker Street, and Railroad Street, in addition to those turning movement counts at each of the, the common intersections. Uh, we also looked through three years' worth of crash data at all intersections throughout the common. Um, so just to touch on some of the, the crash trends that we observed, um, the most common crash was a rear-end collision on Main Street um, approaching the common. This is really due to the, the stop-and-go nature of traffic uh, that is experienced during that PM peak hour. Um, that stop and go nature tends to lend itself to a lot of rear end collisions. There were also a couple of rear end collisions within the common, uh, particularly during a time when a pedestrian was using the crosswalk. Uh, so a driver would stop as a pedestrian would, was uh, within the crosswalk. The trailing vehicle wouldn't uh, expect that driver to, to stop uh, and would, would strike the back of it. There are also a couple of um, sideswipe crashes, particularly enter, uh, exiting the common, I should say, from the inner lane. Uh, School Street and Central Street, this happened on three occasions within that three-year period, and then also at South Street and Mechanic Street uh, at, on one occasion. Um, also, a couple of uh, run-stop signs, particularly we noticed those at Cassett and Mechanic. Um, and I just also wanted to note that there were two bike collisions within the common, too. There are, there are no formal bike facilities um, within, the, within the traffic network in the common, so just wanted to point that out. Uh, should also note that there were no um, pedestrian collisions within that three-year period, too, which is important to note. Uh, so looking at the, um, some of the, the traffic behaviors uh, throughout the common and, and how we thought we might be able to improve circulation, uh, we came up with this, uh, I'll call it a common master plan uh, for the, t the trial period behind me. Um, not all of these we're, are, we're looking to implement currently. Um, Currently, before you today, we're just looking to implement the, the approach from Main Street. Um, I'm just going to run through the process of how we uh, got to this point where we are today. So behind me, you'll see a number of uh, temporary traffic control uh, adjustments that we're looking to make to the common. And these are really looking to be implemented via the use of, of barrels, uh, temporary signs, temporary striping. Uh, so something that can be set up fairly quick and, and broke down fairly quick. Um, just going to start with the, the Main Street approach. So what, was, um, what we had looked at for the original concept was uh, installing a, a temporary island here uh, at the Main Street approach that would really split traffic as it circulates around the common um, and force vehicles that are in that right turn lane or that right lane uh, to turn right and continue up Main Street. Any vehicle that's within that center lane is going to continue uh, through the common. So what this enables traffic to do that's approaching from Main Street is really have a through or a free movement um, from Main Street into the common. So they are given full right to access this, uh, this outer lane while vehicles that are continuing through the common continue through this, uh, this inner lane. Also, to, uh, we had originally looked at making Bird Street uh, one way, exiting the common only as part of this. Um, and we were looking to, um, and we're looking to convert Rock Hill uh, to a one-way entering the common only as part of this. The reason we we're looking at we're looking at making Rock Hill a one-way entering the common only um, is to eliminate this movement where somebody that's circulating the common from the the inner travel lane to cut across somebody that's entering from Main Street entering onto Rock Hill. So we we're trying to avoid that that conflict um, that the the entrance into Rock Hill would create. Um, just continuing to get down, I, again, I just want to be clear that this is not part of tonight's uh, proposal, but the, the entire um, trial period for the common proposal. But similarly, uh, down at South Street and Central, 
uh, looking at introducing a splitter island that again would force traffic that's in the, uh, the inner lane of the common to continue through the rotary traffic that's on the outer uh, lane of the common would either be able to continue to South Street or up through Central Street. And then again, at the intersection with Mechanic Street and Cocasset, again, a similar approach. That inner, inner lane would be forced to uh, maintain uh, traffic flow through the common. The outer lane would be able to exit to Mechanic Street or Cocasset Street. So what we did next was we, we took a look at um, the, we performed a capacity analysis. And, and for these types of intersections, the capacity analysis really looks at the type of, uh, or looks at the amount of delay uh, for each approach coming into the common. And we assessed the conditions of, based on delay for, uh, under the existing geometry and then the proposed geometry uh, to take a look at what impacts um, we could expect to see and also uh, where we could uh, see the, the greatest decrease in delay associated with these changes. Um, so the results of the capacity analysis showed a significant reduction in delay for the southbound approach to the common from Main Street. Um, as I mentioned before when I was going through uh, the modifications at this intersection, um, it's really the, the southbound entrance to the common becomes a, a free movement. So we're allowing that movement uh, from Main Street to have free access to that outside lane while traffic that's continuing through the common uh, is allowed free access to the, the inner lane. Um, as I mentioned before, too, we had looked at converting Bird Street for a, to a one-way uh, roadway. When we did that and we ran our capacity analysis, we ended up uh, redistributing tr trips from Bird Street to Mechanic Street to enter the common. Uh, and what that ended up doing was really overloading Mechanic Street. I mentioned Mechanic Street as one of the intersections that experiences uh, recurrent delay. Um, and adding those additional trips from Bird Street onto Mechanic really um, just exacerbated that condition. Uh, also, the uh, proposed geometric improvements uh, at School Street and, and Central uh, really had a limited impact on uh, the amount of vehicle delay. Uh, as I mentioned, that's, that's one that experiences not quite as much congestion as the other two critical intersections throughout the common. Um, so really, there, there wasn't uh, too much of a significant difference at that location. Uh, so ultimately, the recommendation that, that we've provided to the town is to uh, progressively implement uh, a trial of the proposed improvements uh, at the intersections throughout the common. And what I, what I mean by that, as opposed to implementing all, um, the splitter islands at each of the three locations, um, as I showed in the initial graphic there, uh, is to just implement one uh, rather than, than overload uh, the public and be faced with a number of different traffic circulation changes. So the one that we're recommending on, on starting uh, this, this trial uh, at is uh, the intersection of Main Street, Rock Hill, uh, and Bird Street. And really this, as I mentioned, this location experienced a significant reduction in vehicle delay based on uh, the model that we prepared. Uh, so it has the most potential benefit. Um, it also provides the longest weave distance. So what we're expecting to see is that vehicles that are traveling within that that inner lane of the roundabout, they will now be forced into the outer lane to make any of those exiting movements. Um, so the stretch of the common that provides the longest distance to be able to make that maneuver is that stretch that comes from uh, Main Street, really Main Street to South Street. Uh, we're recommending that Bird Street remain two-way given the anticipated uh, impact to Mechanic Street that a conversion to one-way would be. Uh, and during this trial period, we just wanna make sure that we're closely monitoring traffic behavior um, including that weaving maneuver that I mentioned. Um, and we also want to be monitoring impacts to the other roadways surrounding the common. So we're looking at uh, um, the other parallel um, traffic routes that, um, you know, we currently experience some cut through traffic, but we just want to make sure that, that those roadways are not experiencing any other traffic, as, any additional traffic or um, any unexpected impact. Um, so with the successful implementation at the Main Street intersection, uh, we can look into implementing the other um, trial periods at, at the other uh, three locations throughout the common. Um, so that, that's all I have, Chris. I don't know if you want to touch on anything else before. Nope, just to, <clears throat> just to touch on a couple things. Um, like you said, tonight we're focused on the Main Street intersection. Um, 
we're looking to do a four-week trial um, of that design. Um, with the support of the board, we were to do that start Monday morning. Um, we would run for four weeks, which would take us to November 22nd, um, which is the Friday before Thanksgiving. Um, that that allows us that four week period allows us to see how it really will work the first week or two people are just going to get used to it that third and fourth week or when when we'll actually see if it if it works um, gives people a chance to get used to it and then you know see if they can maneuver it and it and it works the way we expect it to um, we did have some questions at the public meeting last week of if it works why would you take it down um, so that is certainly something that that is on the table um, to leave it up and maybe make it while we go through some final design and analysis from from Park Corp to make it semi permanent until we can actually get out there and do con some construction out there. Um, additionally, to that, um, Chris, could you explain how you would do that? Um, sure. So there's there's a couple different ways. You know the. The initial trial will be done with, with orange barrels. Um, they'll be have lights on them, so they'll be visible at night well, a, along with the reflective stripes on them. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the concerns is we get into December, January, then we start to look at snow. Um, you know, depending on how quick we move forward with the, the final design, um, we can do construction. You know, we limit people to doing that af after November 15th because, you know, it does impact the road. Um, and you never know when snow is going to come. So we could do it with, we could leave the barrels there. We can move them when it's time to plow um, and then put them back after we've cleared all the snow away. Um, that's probably the, the simplest way to do it. Um, you could also get some um, bolt in reflective um, that flop if they get hit. Um, they take a little bit of abuse before they start to fall apart. So we could do something more permanent along the lines of that as well. Um, so there's a couple options we can we can look at if if the trial is going well I think it the comments were and I think it makes sense to keep it going if people are used to it and it's working um, you know one of the things to, to note is that um, the police chief was at the public meeting last week um, he got up and is in full support of of moving forward with this um, one of his, his comments was that the common is 20 miles per hour um, as you enter from from all approaches and as you drive around the common it is 20 miles an hour so a lot of those weave movements at 20 miles an hour um, you know they're they're not as they're not dangerous um, people are, should be going slow enough and they will be on site and, and helping us out while this trial is ongoing to to make sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing um, and he also said that on game days, they park a cruiser exactly where we're proposing this extended island to be, so that that traffic coming down Main Street free flows um, after games and during game before games to get up to 140 as well. So he says it works great. So he's he's in full support of this as well. Um, and then just two more things, <clears throat> um, really one, but on the south side of the common, um, as you were exit. Um, to Central Street and then Cocasset and Mechanic Street. And one of the things we had talked about was taking that dashed line that separates the inside lane and the outside lane and making it a solid white line. It was brought up and it was it, that although the arrow tells you to stay in the inside lane, that dashed line legally allows you to cross it. Um, so we had talked about striping that as a solid white line so that it's just a, it's another visual reminder of people to say, stay in that inside lane, don't exit, which I think would eliminate, well, will help eliminate some of those side swipe movements and accidents that we've had. Um, people trying to exit from the inside lane while people are coming off of Cell Street. And then same thing over at um, Cocasson and Mechanic Street as well. Um, it's a visual cue just to stay in your lane. Um, I think that's all I have for notes at the moment. Questions? Yeah, I'm, um, I was at the meeting last week. Um, <clears throat> I agree with if it's working, let's not change it, especially mm -hmm. when we're taking a street and making it one way for four weeks. So, right. um, I, I think it will work, so I'm definitely in favor of it and in favor of keeping it if it works.
Um, question after four weeks, if it works and we decide to keep it, when do we implement the other two proposed changes to the other two intersections? I think right. we'd probably wait until the spring to move forward with those. Okay. I think we let people get through the winter, let people get used to, continue to get used to that movement up in, on the Main Street section and get rid of the snow before we try anything. And if the Main Street one works, do we still try the other two as a temporary or do we just go all in and say we're changing it? I, I would suggest doing those as a temporary as well. It's a, it's yeah. a little it, each one of these is a different condition, yeah. um, and kind of how I mentioned before the um, the main street stretch lends itself to that longer weave period. So, with implementing these islands at either of the other two locations, we're going to be shrinking that weave area down even a little bit further. Uh, so I think there could be some additional challenges at these these other two locations. Okay. Anything to that? There's there's an aesthetics that goes along with this, um, you know, extending that island permanently up at Main Street. You know, we want to make sure that we're doing that with the look and the feel of the rest of the common. Um, you know, we want to, I think we want to go with granite curbing, um, potential for another planter or two, you know, in that, in that island, um, you know, to kind of keep with that feel. Do what Westwood did and adopt all the islands. <laughs> adopt a bucket. <laughs> Anyone else? So I don't, it's not that I don't agree with everything that you proposed here. Um, I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. And the only way to find out what works and what doesn't, because you can't, you can't simulate human behavior. I think, I think doing the trial is prudent and I think we should do it. Um, I think each one of these temporary uh, tests should be done. Um, my only concern really is if you leave those barrels up or however you do it during snow mm -hmm. and you leave them up, then you take them down, then you put them back up, you know, how are people's behaviors gonna change during those, you know, snow periods? Because you can't wait until it snows. You gotta take them down before the snow flies in advance. The, they'll move real quick on the front end of a loader <laughs> <laughs> with a 13-foot plow on it. <laughs> I understand. Now you, now you have snow and now you have, you know, because you're gonna put up signs that say, that say new traffic pattern. Right. Okay, now all the barrels are gone. You know, what are you, what are you gonna do then? You know what I'm saying? I think you just have to rethink yeah. um, what you're going to do if it does work. Mm -hmm. um, and by all accounts, we, we hope it does work because we want to eliminate <coughs> uh, that back up on, on Main Street. And then, you know, going forward, particularly on the uh, South Street um, extension, uh, where School Street comes to South Street and heading south on 140, I'm just concerned you're going to lose people parking on in in those spaces diagonally. They want to go on 140 South. They're going to have to go all the way around the common to zigzag to get back into into the uh, proper lane to get to 140 South. So I think some people are just going to shy away from those those parking spaces. And then again, I mean, this is what why we do the trial. Yeah, I think that for the the South Street location in particular, the the island itself wouldn't extend back as far as these barrels are shown there. It would really be more of a, a striping, uh, gore style of, of treatment. Really, the only the the only location that would have the the physical island in the permanent condition would be, you know, something in this in this range here that maybe helps break up this crosswalk as well. So the the island itself, I don't think it's, it wouldn't come down here. This would be a solid stripe that that widens out to a, a physical island in this location. So all, all I'm saying, is I understand, you know, we're trying to ease the traffic flow and make, make the flow as, as smooth as possible and, and, and getting around as seamless as possible. But there's so much emphasis on parking. You have to take into account, how does somebody get into those parking spaces and out and then get into that flow of traffic? 
Right. I think that's going to be uh, an interesting scenario once you do these uh, these trials. It'll be uh, really important to collect that data. Yeah. Agreed. Were there many large trucks that were going through? Uh, it seems like it's at least every half hour we have a truck that whether he's lost, wants to get to Route 1, uh, coming through the center or coming up Cocasset Street because he lost his way to cut to Oak to go to 95. Uh, are those lanes going to be wide enough so that they can make turns to get to the streets they want to exit the common from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for, I'll just go back to the, the main street section. Um, we, we did look at uh, tractor trailer making this, this maneuver uh, through here. Uh, these, these barrels are going along the uh, existing lane line. So a, vehicle, a, a larger vehicle is gonna be able to make that, that maneuver through, through the common at that spot. And we did collect um, heavy vehicle data is something that we collect for, through our data collection process too. So we have, we have numbers on that. And that's down on the um, Central Street exit. I think that's probably the biggest concern for the larger vehicles, um, you know, to make sure that they can make that movement from that outside lane on a Central Street. Um, you know, the, the fire engines, the ladder truck, and any of the large tractor trailers that do come through there. Um, I think a, when we get to that point, we'll make sure the barrels are placed in a way that allow them to make that maneuver. Um, and then we'll look at the permanent design down there. Um, my opinion is, and, and when we get there, is that if we do something down there, it'll be flush with existing asphalt. It'll be like a stamped concrete or a stamped colored asphalt, um, almost acting as like a rumble strip that'll keep people in the inside lane. Um, not similar to Westwood with all the way up and down 109, um, where versus having a raised curbing there. So any of the larger vehicles that for some reason think they need to get be in the inside lane to make that move, um, will still have the ability to do that. Okay. Right. No comment. Sure. Um, I think like every like like David, I think we just have to put our trust in the professionals. You know that this is going to help. Um, but we've mentioned a couple of times how our rotary is so different. It is so pedestrian heavy. So you know when I think of free flowing traffic, where we're going to free flow it, people going faster is right in front of the theater where there's 400 people going in and out multiple, you know, times a week. I, I think we need to make sure we keep an eye to pedestrian safety, an eye to the crosswalks. You know that Central Street one's already tough enough. Um, and just make sure that when we're looking at data, we're not only looking at traffic data, but foot traffic as well. And that is something that we're, that we're working on with PAR. Um, you know, we are looking at, do we need all of the crosswalks that are there? Mm -hmm. um, could they be moved um, to better suit everybody? Um, there's some places that you don't want them um, that aren't, aren't there now, um, but some of these things may make it safer. Um, in the long run, that piece on Main Street, as we shrink that island or extend that island, now that um, crossing, and they're only crossing one lane versus crossing two. Um, so some of these features will actually help the pedestrian safety, and we are looking at getting recommendations on where we should put some more flashing crosswalk signs. Um, I think we need to reduce some of the crosswalk numbers before we move forward with that. And then add the, I mean, we talked about the flashers last week, and I think right. those are... Great, yeah, and worth the money. So, in, in talking to the sidewalks, not that I want to put more of a burden on on you guys with plowing because that that is an issue. Yep. But in a lot of areas where they raise the crosswalks, it actually calms traffic mm -hmm. because they they see that that bump coming, they're going to intuitively slow down. Right. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think um, in last week's meeting, the, the topic of, of raised crosswalks came up um, with regards to the common. And in my opinion, the, the common's not the most appropriate location for them, just given the amount of volume that, that circulates there and the fact that every, every single vehicle that crosses over though has to slow down. Uh, there's a lot of bus traffic that goes through the common that has uh, issue with some of those raised crosswalks, uh, emergency vehicles, DPW. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's not the most appropriate use 
but the speed limit's only 20 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you got to slow down to like told, right? 10 to go over those or so. so. Mr. Chairman, with due respect to uh, Dave's comment, and Chris and Tim, you probably we can weigh in on this, that is there, there's the visual effect of sidewalks that you can where you paint them can sometimes uh, draw more attention to them as well. Um, and uh, we've seen that in other, other locations around town, and maybe that's a better option as opposed to raised. Or even like, I'll call it Pat's new speed limit sign, it's hers now, you know, one of those flashing things that says crosswalk. You know, it's just got a little bit of lights and it draws your attention to make sure someone knows that there's a crosswalk there, mm -hmm. you know, as they're looking over their shoulder and weaving in traffic. And Yeah, I think, I think both of those, both the, the 3D style, style crosswalk and uh, mm -hmm. certainly the addition of flashers are, you know, safety measures that, that could be appropriate here. Um, I will say with the, with the flashing systems, they, they tend to work better when they're actuated by a pedestrian. They're not continuously flashing. Mm -hmm. Drivers get used to things that continually flash when there's no conflict or no warning or there's no reason to be um, to perceive any danger. So the, the ones that are only actuated um, when there's a pedestrian there are, are typically a, a more safer option. And Chris, you said those were like $4,000-ish, right? They weren't astronomical. No, they're f yeah, they were four thousand um, per side. Mm -hmm. So if we so we would put them on both sides of the crosswalk, mm -hmm. and that would be about eight thousand dollars at this point in time. It was a solar powered, right? Yeah. Any other comments? So you need a, a, a motion by us to proceed with phase one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, make a motion to proceed with the traffic improvements as discussed tonight before this board? Phase one. Phase one. <laughs> Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Aye. Great Thank presentation, you. Chris. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Appreciate guys. The work. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, folks, that's Chris Gallagher. <laughs> 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 May I make one uh, plug? No. Yes. <laughs> so as you know, you've heard me talk ad nauseum about our conversation on housing, and it's starting. So on November 13th, we're having our first community outreach. Stay tuned for more details, but I'm hoping the folks in the audience tune in and uh, pay attention, come to the meeting, check out online. But So it's November 13th, and uh, we look forward to talking about housing. That, that topic is more relevant today than ever in any time in history. Um, there was an article that came out today um, in CNBC that said that, um, that right now that, that the amount of housing uh, that's valued below $200,000 is only at 10% in the, in the country right now, which is the lowest point that it's, it's ever been. So um, that and the fact that, that raising that lower interest, rate, interest rates are causing the, the amount of housing um, inventory to shrink rather dramatically at this point. So that, that means that prices continue to go up and the, and the young folks who are trying to get housing on, on one end are being shut down as well as the seniors on the other end are being shut out of the market. So more than ever, we need to have that conversation. And we have some graphics in the low lobby of town hall. Take a look at them, because the numbers are fairly compelling when you start to understand, you know, you, you might be OK, but your neighbor might not be OK. So just take a look, and uh, we look forward to talking about it. Thank, Thank you, you, Paige. Right. Thanks, Paige. All right, uh, Gillette Stadium annual vent license. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. So everyone, this is Pat Costello. He's actually our, ta our town council. Town council. He's, he's the original town council. That uh, I know that, that Kate Conley sits in for him a lot, and he's one of well, she's one of the partners at his firm. But Pat is the lead, one of the lead members of the firm, and uh, has been was here when when he when he originally proposed to be part of this this process for the town. So just as a, a lead into this discussion, uh, Peter Tam is also here uh, rep representing the uh, the craft group from Goulston Stores, and. What we have for you tonight is um, you sort of your first look at this, even though we, we've discussed it for, what, three, four years now. We've been going back and forth about creating an annual license opportunity for having events and uh, games and, and, uh, and all kinds of things that occur at Gillette Stadium. The, as the board will know and, and has experienced that we've gone, we have typically throughout the year anywhere from eight to ten different hearings that occur based upon the, the types of events that occur at the stadium. Um, what's happened in a lot of venues across the country now, and it's even more commonly happening even here in Massachusetts at Boston, the city of Boston does this as well as Man Mansfield, 
is that we've they've gone to an annual license uh, scenario where which would uh, allow the the board the, uh, the the proponent in this case the craft group to come before the board sometime we think probably April of, of each year uh, to actually present the board with a listing of all the events that occur over that next 12 month cycle um, the reason it starts in April is because the NFL schedule comes out and usually around the middle of April and then that is a, is a point of obviously a very important piece of information for how the events occur beyond beyond that period of time at that point also there will be a good indication of, of where the rev schedule is uh, also the um, the concert season will, will be uh, a good indicator at that point as well so most of the information that is needed to have that annual license will be in place and will be presented as part of that license this particular document has gone through multiple iterations um, and we've worked hard on this to get it to this point and I, th I appreciate the cooperation of everybody in, in trying to make this happen because it is an important piece of information and an important document for the town what's uh, also a piece that has to be done is that because the uh, the state statutes for licensing for uh, annual licenses usually runs from January through December 31st of each year so which would mean that if, if unless we came up with a, a legislative legislative relief we would have to the license would have to be uh, we'd have to come the process would have to start earlier than that and it would actually fall into the into the uh, the, the 12 month cycle so what we were asking to do as part of this as well is to file for special legislation that would allow the cycle to go from for Gillette Stadium to run from April from May 1st of each year to April 30th of the following year so therefore um, we would only have to do that once instead of twice throughout the year now if there are certain events that occur that you know, are unique events that, that would occur any time during the year um, the the, uh, the proponent the, the craft group would have to come before this for the board and actually ask for an amendment to that license to include that at a particular event or at any time throughout the year if there was a question about a particular event the board could still request them to come before you to clarify the situation and the events the police chief and the fire chief have weighed in on this process some uh, have heavily weighed in on this process and uh, they have a lot of authority in this license as well so particularly of course public safety being the number one concern that we all have, are, are concern, have a have major uh, consideration here so that's the summary of the issue I'm going to let Pat talk about maybe some of the more details beyond that and certainly pay, uh, Peter can speak as to why it's important from the from the uh, proponents perspective as well Okay. Great. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board. Uh, as noted, this is not a novel idea. This is something we've literally been back and forth with the craft group, or now um, craft sports and entertainment LLC as a licensee for three and a half to four years. Uh, we, we were engaged in multiple matters relative to the stadium. We, we felt it was a priority in putting a couple of things to rest before we delved into this particular area. We did successfully resolve the other issues. Uh, we met <clears throat> several times over the past year uh, with council and representatives from the craft organization to try to fine-tune this document. And I do think it's at a point now where it's ready for, for you folks to take a look at and, uh, you know, let us know what issues, concerns, or, or comments you may have regarding the license um, uh, as an annualized document rather than the individual event license process that we have right now. As Bill noted, this is very common in this uh, day and age for large venues to have an annual license where the events are predictable and can be uh, determined ahead of time. Uh, I, I can assure you that having reviewed the formal li uh, the license we're currently using now, this document incorporates the, the protections and the level of discretion that the Board of Selectmen would have as a licensing authority. So we're not foregoing or waiving any rights in that regard. In my view, what it does is provide a more streamlined and a more predictable process, both for the Board as well as for the licensee. Uh, the, based on recent conversations with them, uh, the craft folks believe that the spring, as Bill noted, April or May of each year, is a point in time where things somewhat come together in terms of their upcoming events, whether it be for the summer season, the NFL schedule is, is determined, and the rev schedule comes more into to focus. We think that it would be efficient for both the town as well as for the licensee 
to have a single annual license that would address all such events without skimping on any information relative to each particular event, the license still requires that the applicant submit with the license application a summary sheet, a data sheet, if you will, for each event that it is aware of at that point in time that will be encompassed into the license. The town will have ample time to review the documents submitted. Should the board have any questions or concerns relative to the license? Should the police chief or fire chief have any concerns relative to particular events? They can always be addressed individually at the application stage and or later on even. There is still broad discretion factored in on public safety matters whereby the police chief, the fire chief, can impose additional requirements should they deem them necessary based on events as they have evolved since the license issued. So I, I, I believe that uh, this is a document that is certainly worthy of the board's consideration. I do think it, 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 it brings us up to speed, so to speak, with trends in, in other venues that do have large uh, events uh, venues such as this. And I, I do believe that as, as your counsel, I can tell you that it does incorporate the level of protection and security as well as the level of discretion that the board currently possesses under the general laws. We're not waiving any of that in this particular document. Notably, the document, um, and I'll talk in a minute about the point Bill raised about the uh, term of the license, which is presently determined by statute. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. but. The license incorporates the same level of insurance requirements that, that currently apply. It incorporates the same indemnification language that we have been utilizing that our insurance company and insurance council have prepared and recommended for us. That applies, as I said, for each event that is to be su the subject of the license, there is a data sheet that will have to be individually prepared and submitted with the license application so that the board will have the same level of knowledge or information relative to events that it gets now. You'll just get it at one point in time and will have an opportunity to review it and raise questions at the initial license application uh, date. There is also an opportunity for the board to weigh in on any material change in the license terms or the addition of any new events to the license. The way the agreement is currently structured, should the licensee wish to change events or add additional events to the license, they provide notice to the town whereupon if the board has any questions or concerns relative to the impacts that these additional events might have on public safety, you can require a full public hearing on the matter. You can require additional information to be submitted. And that additional event will not be allowed unless and until the hearing process and your approval is obtained. Should the board, upon review of the request for additional or changed items, not believe that there is any material risk of increased public safety concern, we don't have to have a hearing. It will be deemed incorporated into the license, provided that they provide us with appropriate notice, and thus we will proceed accordingly with um, the same terms and conditions of this license applying to the new event. And the same fee structure will apply to the universe of events that are incorporated into the annual license as applies to the individual license applications right now. So the fees will be the same. The insurance requirements imposed upon the licensee will be the same. The licensee will continue to agree to indemnify and hold us harmless to the same extent that they are now under the individual license uh, process we, we're currently abiding by. And uh, there is, again, one thing we, we were very focused on during negotiations is making sure that our police and fire chiefs had the right to review each of upcoming event 
as they were transpiring and to alter the public safety, health, and order conditions as they deemed appropriate. As we all know, things change. Conditions can change. We do have the right to intercede in such circumstances where we feel that the public safety or well-being is, is, is potentially threatened to impose additional con conditions, whether they be uh, traffic-related, uh, pu public safety-related, EMS, wh whatever it may be. Uh, there is that level of oversight or input allowed during the term of the license as well. That's a general overview of the license document itself and, and the process that would apply to the issuance of the license. Uh, the provisions of uh, Mass General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 183A, which is the entertainment license for, for sporting events, entertainment events, um, does have a, a provision therein that says every license issued under that section um, terminates on December 31st of each calendar year. Given the unique situation that the licensee in this particular situation faces with, as Bill noted, the primary event uh, schedules being determined in the late spring or mid-spring, we think it would be more appropriate and more constructive and efficient if we were able to issue an annual license uh, with a term that coincides with the periods of time when the licensee can best advise the board what events are going to take place and when. Uh, May 1st roughly appears to be that date under this licensing scheme, given the football schedule coming out then, summer concert schedules being tightened up at that point in time, and, and the, the soccer schedules coming to fruition then as well. What we're going to propose uh, for the board's consideration is a, a special act that would quite simply amend the termination clause in, in uh, Chapter 140, Section 183A to state rather than ending on December 31st, uh, no license shall the, exceed the term of one year from the date of its issuance unless earlier revoked. We would retain all rights to revoke the license as we always do at any time, yet the license whenever issued would, would continue in existence for a one-year period from that date. Ideally, the way things look right now, that would be like a, a spring license commencement date and a spring termination date. And again, because of the, the, the uh, adjustment provisions within the license document itself, events can be added to or modified with the board's consent throughout that term. So I don't really see any issue with that um, modification. I do think it makes sense in many ways. If, we, if our objective here is to streamline uh, the process, make it simpler or more efficient for both sides, more predictability, that would be a, an ideal provision. Now, the way to affect such a special act would be twofold. Uh, number one, uh, town meeting could authorize the board, as I'm sure it's, it's done on numerous occasions, to file a petition with the general court for special legislation to modify a special act as it relates to Foxborough. There is an alternative provision in the amendments to the Constitution that allows for such a, uh, a special act if the uh, governor recommends um, a modification. We think for purposes of expediency, if we were to approach the, the administration and utilize our, our legislative representatives on Beacon Hill uh, jointly to advocate for such a modification, there's a possibility we might even be able to get this in place for next spring so that the 2020 slash 21 license could, could uh, operate under the new terms. So. We, well, we certainly wouldn't, uh, the, the board would have to approve any such move to, uh, uh, you know, authorize our, our legislative delegation and or the governor on our behalf to seek such a, a change in the legislation. That would be the only change in the statute that we'd be looking for, just extending the license termination date from 1231 of each year to within one year from the date of issuance of the license. Happy to answer any questions. On that note, like the Boston Garden comes to mind because the Bruins and the Celtics mm -hmm. start in the fall and they go hopefully through June and win the playoffs. Yeah. Um, do they have any special provisions? 
I do, I do believe Boston has some special licensing authority that other st the cities and towns in the state do not have. I'm not sure, uh, Chris, if that goes right to the date of the license, but I, I'm, I do know that they, they issue a, a, an annual license or a, a multi-event license, not an individual event by event license. Okay. And then a um, couple of questions on the actual draft that we have mm -hmm. of the um, event license. Is this the latest draft that we have? Um, it's dated 5-30-19? Yes. Okay. We, we, we actually talked about it again over the course of the summer, and we also discussed the, the special legislation, but we wanted to pr make sure that all both sides were satisfied with it from a staff level anyways before we brought it to you folks. This is the latest draft. Okay. Um, the after the the f opening paragraph uh, number one it says and shall expire on december 31st that's carryover language uh, unless and until we get special legislation that's the way the annual license okay. would have to work so if that was where i was going so if if we couldn't get special legislation the governor said no i'm not doing it right go to town meeting they say right. no we don't want to we can still do this annual license we just have to do it in Right, I mean that's correct. No, you're absolutely correct. Right. If if we do not obtain the special legislation, this language is, will be what will be in the next license. Okay. If right. if the board this chooses. all can still happen, the, the oh, yes. annual license without that. Okay. Absolutely. All right. All right. I think I think the, the the key point though is that think about it, that you know the the NFL schedule doesn't even actually goes into January. Yeah. So we'd be we'd be cutting off a portion of the, of the schedule and have to restart have to come up with a new license using the same NFL schedule. For, yeah. two, for two, two, uh, two calendar yeah. years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and again, too, I, I think my entire tenure on the board, we've been talking about this, um, mm -hmm. so I'm very comfortable with it all. Okay. Yeah, that that, that goes with, with me as well. Um, I think I may have been chairman when we first started. This. Yes, I think you are, in fact. <laughs> um, and you know, early on, one of our concerns was waiving any of our rights as a licensing authority so I'm, I'm glad to see that we still retain those rights um, in this uh, in this draft so uh, like Chris I'm, I'm very comfortable with with where this is now with the with the caveat that we we do retain our, our rights as a licensing authority yeah. I think it's really crucial if we're going to have an annual license that there's definitely going to be a mechanism in there so that if something is added that it would allow public safety uh, to review the potential of an add-on and have an opportunity for this board to have a unique hearing for that particular event as mm -hmm. they're added that are not planned per se, but are like a pop-up thing right. that could present challenges. And the, the way it is drafted now, Mr. O'Leary, is once they submit the written notification to the board of an, an additional event, you folks would have, it's only 15 days, it's a short period as it's drafted now, but just to review that request, and if you believe, or you deem that any aspect of this new event could cause some issue with respect to public safety, you have a right to just notify them that, in fact, we do want to have a public hearing on it, and we'll go through that whole process. But that doesn't eliminate the public, but police, both police and fire review of the entire event. Right. As part of that. Thank you. So no financial change to the town as a result of this is what, no. what I'm hearing you say? No. Okay. Oh. And though I will note that the, this whole thing started during the conversation when, when during the uh, the seats that were taken out of the end right. zone, and that's and this and this sort of folded into that process. But we reached agreement on how to resolve that issue, and uh, and then this was the second phase of that discussion was this piece here. And I mean I've never seen the other one, the old one. I don't know if it's possible to, possible to upload that. Not that I have a comment, but you know we see the new one and we hear you telling us. But when we you know go back and think about sure. stuff, it's without any kind of summary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have no further comment. I, I, unlike my whole tenure, 
I've heard about this also. I think it's a great idea. Um, sitting here now, what, um, what, so, what do so, you need from us? Well, to the, go the thought would be that if the board is comfortable with, with uh, moving this along, I think you would you would want to approve it as a uh, conditional approval. Well, with two, really two caveats that if it be approved, um, that if the even with if it goes to December thirty first, it would still be approved. But if it's if it's if it gets amended to change the date through the legislation, mm -hmm. I think that would that would uh, it would be approved both ways. So um, you'd have the ability to do it either way. Now I think um, the, the, you'd really need two actions. One is to proceed to submit something to the to the governor for consideration of this. Of the legislation, legislative piece. So how would we do that? Would you so write a letter or uh, be a, a letter with the, with the actual legislation? And legislation was made part of your packet, so you mm -hmm. have it. Right. It's a, just a couple lines. It's, it's very piece, straightforward. Piece, yeah. Very straightforward piece. And then, um, and so the, the the first action would be to conditionally approve the license, um, subject to uh, approval of the yeah. legislative if, authority. And if select woman gives and wants to review the existing license, mm -hmm. obviously for. Comparison purposes, we, right. we yep. can afford exactly. time for that. I guess I just don't. I guess I don't understand why would even conditionally approve. Why don't we just move the legislation forward and then come back and review it when and if that's approved? Is there a reason that we don't want to do that? Yeah, well, because we still have. Yeah, the, we still have the January first to December thirty first. Right. Yes, and and also if we are without the um, annual entertainment license. We're still working on a piecemeal basis, so even though the, the individual licenses we may be issuing may not be burdened by that December 31st mm -hmm. date, it, it, it would still be, it'd be crazy, because we'd be looking at one-year periods now from each date that each respective license issued. It would be difficult, in my, in my view, to track you know, the, 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 the terms of the multiple licenses that would be out there. The concept is to have one license covering the vast majority, if not all, of the events that are licensed in a year and have the license in effect for a one-year period from the date of issuance of that license. So on, without the first piece of the puzzle, the annual license, um, we could certainly uh, pursue the special legislation, but that would still give us like a rotating term, if you will, for all of the respective licenses that are issued. I think it's a little complicated from an administrative perspective. So we're still looking at an annual license. No, I, I get that. I yeah. just, okay. you know, I, okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe Peter could weigh in a little bit more uh, from Goulston Stores, Peter, Peter Tam, to, on, on the reasons why that would still be important. Uh, thank you, Bill. And for the record, Peter Tam of Goulston and Stores. Um, I appreciate having a few minutes, and I, I really can't summarize this more succinctly than both Pat and Bill have. And we're on a first name basis because we've spent a lot of time on this. Um, essentially what you have today is an ad hoc piecemeal way of approving event licenses. And unlike uh, sort of a pilot for traffic improvements at the Rotary, there's little risk here. I think what, what Pat has summarized is that there's no change to the protections and the oversight that this board has. But what you're getting is the ability to comprehensively evaluate all the events at a single time and be able to assess them by the same rules. And that's why we, on behalf of the craft group, like it. Because um, uh, all the time that we spend before you um, for different events can be minimized. We can plan accordingly. We can assess accordingly. We know specifically what the traffic demand management requirements are that we would spend with the police department on, and they're consistent. And we've uh, there's been a thoughtful approach that you'll see in the draft before you, um, where different uh, you know a, a football or a, a, an athletic event is treated differently than a concert event, and and you see that. So I, I think Pat. It, it's up to the board as to how they want to proceed. But I think what, what Bill and, and Pat have described is exactly right. We would like um, to invest in the annual event license and spend the time with the board at a time that's appropriate. The special legislation is going to be an issue today 
whether or not you do the, the annual event because of um, that particular provision uh, which Pat mentioned in one of the three laws that governs this. And so we'd like to fix that as it pertains to the stadium in Foxborough specifically because of the unique nature of football in particular. And we should fix that. And we want to support the town uh, and, and help to fix that so we don't have to appear before you essentially at the end of the year, not knowing when football is going to be, when, when, you know, when the schedule is going to come out. Yeah, I don't know if my question, maybe if I'm not understanding the answer, or if maybe my question was misunderstood, but it's not a question of if the annual license at all. It's more about the order of doing things. So, you know, get, getting the legislation first and then approving it versus it sounds like you want to approve it first conditionally and then get the legislation. Well, the, I, I guess for, for the board's consideration, you, you have to ask yourself, is there value to having a comprehensive assessment of events at the stadium? Mm -hmm. That's question number one. And then question number two is, regardless of where you come down on that, we need to clean up this particular provision of the general laws. So, so I, I think maybe I can help you with that, Leah. So, so if we were to do this first license, we wouldn't do it probably until April of next year anyways. That's right. So I'm saying why not just approve it in March? The, the, like, like why not go through the legislature and then come back and look at this draft? Well, I think it, at that point will be going, going back to just thinking about what you just said, it would be nice to be able to go to the governor and say, we're, we're ready, this is conditionally approved, mm -hmm. saying that we're, we're ready to do this if you can, if you can help us fix this piece. Yeah, my question's not about why to do it or if right. to do it. It's more about There's also the timing of why not why now versus March if we're not looking to do it till later. Yeah, I, I I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. Mm -hmm. Um but I do agree that we would like some predictability here. There there's going to be you know, what we would owe you if you approved this concept is we would then be preparing for the spring and a filing based on your approval this evening. Right, and that 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 would it could take us from May to the end of the year, the end of the calendar year, or if special legislation has been adopted, it would carry over to the next spring. And what we would have for you in May is a completed application based on on this license, uh, along with the term, uh, the completed insurance provision preliminary schedule events, and a stadium event data sheet for every single event. And the, fees, and the fees for each one of the events. Yeah. So. And just something to think of, too, is that's typically when our board turns over is that first week of May, which is change of chairs, change of members, so just something to be aware well, of. We could, we could do it at, uh, you know, just talking with Bill in mm -hmm. advance, we could do it at a time that's appropriate. So it doesn't have to be May 1, it could mm -hmm. be right. May 15. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think one of the benefits of approving the annual license now there's predictability there, mm -hmm. whereas the special legislation, there's zero predictability. Mm -hmm. it, could, it could be three months, it could be a year. I mean, we, we've gone through, um, let me look at, look at what we're trying to do with the uh, child safety bill. Right. I mean, going on, what, three years now? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it seems benign, but you never know, right. you know, what's going on up at the state house and what becomes a priority. And, what somebody else might want to add on to it. Hey, this, this looks like it's a good idea. Let's, let's add some, some additional legislation to it. And, so. and I think Peter's point is well taken that when the governor and the legislature, quite frankly, are, are reviewing the special act, it would be nice for them to have mm -hmm. a model of what the license is going to look like rather than not knowing what, what they're voting to approve in essence. So I think that could be helpful. I think, I think my experience dealing with the legislature is that they like to know that the, that the community is in full support of the license itself when you bring the, the piece that, that changes the, the date on it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the, my reasoning to having to want it to be done that way. But it's a fair point, Leo. Yeah, my point is if something changes yeah. in the legislature, you know, we have to come back anyway and do it. But I, I right. see both sides of it. It's just really a timing question. It just gives the, the yeah. people at the stadium more time to plan out mm -hmm. um, for events, concerts, whatever. So. And, and I, I, I take the point, um, I think Mr. Mr. O'Leary uh, identified that uh, there certainly will be changes over the course of the year. And so there's a process that we focused on. Uh, that, that anticipates that. Uh, but that's no worse than what you have today, and we try to minimize those. There's, 
uh, a number of requirements where we can't be hasty about it. We have to, depending on whether it's an addition versus a change, we have to submit in advance. Uh, and then you have the opportunity to call a hearing if appropriate. Right. And I will say, and Peter would agree with me, that was perhaps the most contentious point we negotiated over time because they're on a tight schedule in terms of booking events. They have to, they're at risk of getting a license when they commit to performers or entertainers coming in, so they need relatively quick turnaround, yet we don't want quick turnaround from your perspective so that you have ample time to, to weigh uh, an additional event. So while the notification time to the, the board and then the 15-day period within which the board has to act is relatively tight, all that you have to do is believe that there is something that could, again, impair public safety or public health with respect to an event to trigger the public hearing process. It's a subjective judgment, certainly to be made in good faith on your part based on a legitimate concern, but it, it would give the opportunity, of, you know, to Mr. O'Leary's point about having full review and public input on an additional event. All right, um, did you get all that in? <laughs> yes, <I> do. <laughs> do you think you could make a uh, motion? Uh, Wait, but perhaps, Pat, would you maybe sure. uh, give him some wording for that? To I'd help suggest him that? a motion along the lines of uh, uh, the board vote to approve conceptually an annual license for events at Gillette Stadium in the format submitted to the board here tonight and two, to authorize uh, staff to work with our state legislatures and the governor's office to craft the special legislation that was submitted for your review this evening. So you might want to take it as two, 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 two separate, separate two ones. Separate okay. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> right. I can't take notes. Actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but was that, um, did you get yeah. that? Yeah, it's, well, it's taped, so we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll it. Get it. Yeah, so, we'll get it. Okay, yeah. so, so moved. Uh, make a motion as uh, the public has heard tonight on number one uh, to approve conceptually the annual license for stadium events. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, make a motion to authorize uh, moving forward with the potential of working with the governor's office to obtain legislation uh, that would fit in with the needs of both our community and the craft group. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thanks for everybody Great. for the Thank you. work on yeah. this. Appreciate it. Thank you. My thanks to both these gentlemen for a, a long, a long process, but thank you for a thank you. Some fine work here. Thank you very much. It was great. Great work with you all, both of you. We look forward to seeing you in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> Once. Once, yeah. Thanks. All right. Good job. Uh, selectman's update. Anybody have uh, anything for Selectman's update? Just um, hot off the press, the Veterans Day ceremony is going to feature the 215th Army Band this year. Do we know anyone in the band? Yeah. <laughs> one of their trombone players, um, one of Foxborough's finest. There you go. Awesome. My son. Uh, just uh, uh, also as a, an update, the uh, rec department's having their annual Halloween costume parade on uh, 1026. Uh, they meet at the IGO at uh, 240. Um, someone brought up a good point to me uh, about the, I mean, it's great that we have the Schneider lot now, but at night there's no lights. Uh, might be something we might want to address uh, going forward. Um, maybe bring it to George's attention. George. George. I mean, not George. I was, I was like, okay. Roger. Who's this? Roger. Uh, Roger. Roger, yeah. Went to school with a George Hill, and that's why I keep calling him George. All right, Roger. What do you think? I, I don't know if that we could actually build lighting there because it was, it's their property. Right. Um, but if there is lighting in the area, maybe that can be redirected somehow. I, I'm not just, sure about just that. Just a thought. It was we'll a, have to inquire about it. Yeah. But we'll, right. we'll do that. And uh, this is very uh, disconcerting, um, the letter we got um, 
from the uh, IBEW? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, so we, there's a story behind that, and um, I, I actually sent it, forwarded to Bill Eubner, um for the chairman of the building committee. And um, actually, it's, I think it's, it's actually a little, um, it's a little, it's not entirely accurate by stating it that way. What's happened is that the, 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 the same bid was accepted by four other bidders in that project. They, the bid they accepted was, is a uh, minority-owned uh, business, which, which brings the, the project into compliance with the required minimums for, for, for uh, minority representation. It's a, it's a women-owned business that, that actually has that. And for, so the, the determination, actually all the other, four, there were five bidders in this project, four of them used that same bidder for, the, for that project. So that the, the amount of savings overall for the project is still lower than, than any of the other bids as well. So I, to say it one, they say it one way is that the, the town is being cheated out of money is actually not accurate because the overall cost of the project was about a million and a half dollars lower than what was anticipated. So, um, and, that, and, and all four of the, the, the higher bidders as well used the same person. So there was only one company that used the, the uh, non, the, and this happens to be a, a union represented company, whereas the other four were not, the, the other four, the, the other company is not. So this is, they're advocating for a union, union workers, union workforce, and we understand that. And they have the right to do that, but to, to say that the town is being somehow cheated out of some money in this case is not an accurate reflection of really what happened. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> anybody else? All right, Bill. So there's a, uh, just a, a couple things to, to bring to your attention. One is that today I met earlier with the EPA representatives and DEP uh, representatives to talk about the Hathaway Patterson site. Is everybody familiar with that site? That's the area looked at off County Street, where the parking lot has been placed, where we've been using as the commuter parking lot area. That was a Superfund site at one time, and now has been since uh, since taken off that list. But they still have to do um, reviews of that of that property for several years, going forward into the future, just to make sure that there is no uh, additional uh, concerns coming out of that location. Um, the five-year review proved to be um, proved to be very successful, They're, and the, they pointed out some some things to us. There is some cracks in the pavement, which we'll have to fill, which we will do in the spring, and also uh, they wanted the, us to, to to sweep the site, which will be actually done within the next week or two. So we're, we're fully uh, appreciative of the fact that this is uh, the site that's still intact, it's doing, it's doing very well based upon the mitigation that was given to it. Uh, just to remind you that the AGCOM is meeting tomorrow night from, uh, from 7 to 9, we think, right? Uh, <laughs> we, we hope, right? 7 yeah, to 9. We'll be, we'll be here. <laughs> All right, we'll be here for tomorrow night from 7 to 9. And there's, there are four articles remaining that have to be recommended. The other Remaining articles were approved. The other eight remaining articles were approved by the, are recommended by the advisory committee. Uh, articles one, two, and three uh, still require a recommendation, as well as Article 12. Um, and then that relates to the, the board's request to try and do the, uh, they have to have the hearing part, uh, uh, is allowing the, the board the, the authority to, uh, to appoint the, the town manager to do that work as opposed to doing it yourself in all, in all cases. So uh, that, that particular provision is being looked at a little bit closer. Um, there was a question raised as to whether or not there was a legality issue with that, whether that could be done legally. Town Council is of the opinion they think it can because it has been done in a couple other communities. Um, and uh, since that time, there's been further look to see if there they was it done by through special act by doing it that way. And in, in, in the cases that we're aware of, that was not the case. So we think it can be done by bylaw as, as was proposed in this instance as well. We're just waiting to hear back from the AG's office. If the AG office says that it can't be done, then we'll just amend it on the floor and we'll provide you with an amendment as a part of the motion to correct that and, um, and hold off until a further town meeting where we can correct that, that particular situation. It would have to be done by special act if that would be the case. Then you said one, two, and three, they haven't. Voted so on so one, two, and three, uh, one is the, is the money to, to put money into the stabilization account when we're recommending a $250,000 deposit of money into that account, uh, which would then bring the, uh, the account uh, well above the minimum required, which is $100,000. The minimum required, and right now it's about 55000 so this is the first opportunity for us to address that once free cash has been certified. Well, we're in the process of certifying it right now. And we're recommending that uh, $250,000 be put into that account for capital uh, stabilization. 
the stabilization account itself is actually over the, the required minimum. Uh, it's about we're required to have 5%, and we have actually 5.5% in our general stabilization account. The fact that we have two stabilization accounts that actually act as one, so we, we're actually over and above the required minimums uh, by actually a wider margin than 5.5% by having those two amounts in. Um, but I'll be discussing that a little bit at the uh, at the uh, summit coming up on Thursday. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, the board, uh, the adcom will take up item one, item two, which is the amendment to the to the administration budget, and three is is the police cruiser. So um, so if any of the board members uh, certainly want to advocate for that, I think tomorrow night would be a good time to do that. Um, I think we've had a lot of in input into that discussion so far, and I think the adcom has a lot of information about it. But certainly, uh, if the board wants to participate, they, you uh, certainly can do that. Uh, again, the financial summit's on Thursday night from 6.30 to 8. It will be held right here in this same room. And so I, I welcome, uh, welcome everyone to attend. We, the advisory committee, the board of selectmen, the school committee will all be in attendance that night, as well as the public and any, any uh, interested uh, residents, as well as uh, uh, town uh, uh, employees or committees that want to participate in the discussion as well. On uh, Saturday, I leave for, uh, for the ICMA National Conference in Nashville, Tennessee this year, and I'll be away all of next week, uh, but we'll be, and we'll be returning the following week. Um, really important point that uh, the train commuter rail um, starts, uh, the commuter rail will start in here in Foxborough October 21st. I believe the first train's around 547 in the morning, and so we certainly welcome Anybody who wants to be out there to see that happen, that's a little bit of an historic uh, action that day. And so we're very pleased to see that finally come to fruition. So we, we, this will be sort of a soft opening at this point in time, but, it, but we'll do a more formalized open opening later on with a little bit more, a bit more of a ceremony. I think we want to make sure that they, everything works you know, is on time and works the way it's supposed to work before we, before we have the formal uh, send off. Um, Mike and I will be doing interviews. I think I will steal some of your thunder for Amanda's replacement. Uh, we're starting that process, phone interviews tomorrow, and then in-person interviews, we hope, by Friday. Uh, and then finally, just the special town meeting uh, is scheduled for November 4th, um, at, uh, which is a Monday night at 7.30 p.m. at the high school. And there are 12 articles for consideration at that time. That's all I have. I just have one additional point, and that is that our um, DPW director, Roger Hill, um, has given us his intention to retire um, in the first week of January. So we have posted that position. Uh, it's on the HR page of the town's website, and, uh, and we'd, we'd, we've started the active uh, recruitment process, and uh, where that's going to run uh, through the, the two sets of holidays. Uh, we've given that uh, 10 weeks to give us plenty of time, this, and uh, we're building the team uh, to do that recruitment. So um, it's quite an extensive job description, and you can see it on the HR website. That's all I have. What's the team going to look like the, for the interview process? Like how extensive? So, um, so it's going to there's going to be several members of the staff. Myself and uh, Bill will be involved in that. The water commission will be involved. Um, we will have uh, uh, someone who's uh, who's been um, actually we'll have two former DPW directors. Actually, one former and one active mm -hmm. uh, DPW directors. Um, uh, as well we as we should get a member of the board, us board, to serve as well in this one as well, for the, for because seeing it's a, it's a major department head. Yeah. So I'm sorry I didn't convey that yeah. message to you, but we should do that because we typically have done that for anyone that's a major department head. Yeah. And then. Um, you know, I plan uh, on having the uh, the building commissioner and the uh, the planning director involved in that as well. Any other questions on that recruitment? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. All right, Ed, action item. Uh, motion to approve a public event application for Halloween parade and trick or treating on 1026 2019 from 2:30 p.m. to 4 p.m. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Motion to accept the firefighters assistance grant in the amount of $138,727.27. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept a gift donation of $2,500 to the Recreation Department from Stephen and Susan Berlone for the Booth Playground. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept a gift donation of $112 to the Veterans Services Department from the Fisher School Sunshine Water Fund in memory of Philip Conway. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to accept a gift donation of $250 to the Veterans Services Department from James S. Daly, Jr. and Paula M. H. Daly. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept a gift donation of $100 to the Veterans Services Department from L. Grasso in memory of Philip T. Clark. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept a gift donation of $10,000 to the Boyden Library from John N. Spinney and Aaron S. Halperin, Charitable Giving Trust to be used for the Spinney See, uh, sp the Spinney Speakers Series cost. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to approve the 9 30 19 meeting minutes. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to approve the 10-1-2019 meeting minutes. Second. Any further discussion? I guess just under discussion we had, I had a couple people reach out to me. I know people reached out to Bill too. We're still taking meeting notes. That was just talk away in the future. So although there's no one in the seat tonight, just letting the public know All right. there's still meeting minutes happening because there was some confusion yeah. with that talk about special legislature in the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All those in favor? All right. All right, Ed. Is there another? No, 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 move to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Aye.